Yeah, he has to like choose left or you just and the No piece of text that that is missing, showing his content. <laughs> Everything, except for oh, what is he going to show it? And then I take the mic. Yeah, let's start. Now. Yeah, but you can start out the sixties, but let me talk. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's good to have you all here. We have, besides our physical crowd, a few more people that join us online through YouTube. And the reason why we do make it such a big deal today, bless you, is because we have the honor to have Christopher Fabian with us, who used to be a teacher here at Harvest Base, but only in the first year. Now he's way too busy because he's working with UNICEF, actually. And that means that he is trying to help the world connecting education with open source technology. 
he will share some of his insights with us, and then we will turn into a Q&A, guys, where you can really raise your questions, whatever you might have. And he also reserved some time later on for us to actually sit down at the Sax Cafe across the street. If you want, let's, let's take it to an informal level afterwards. All right, let's give him a big hand. Thanks, Amir. Um, and I guess I need this because of online folks, right? Yeah, cool. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, that's a very generous introduction. I do work at UNICEF now. I work in a project called GIGA. Oh, you can see it up there. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, I wanted to talk about sort of the journey of how we got as a team of technologists and designers and developers into this very strange place in an international organization. Um, and also talk about what we're working on now, which is global connectivity. Um, and I think that in when I was here last time, 2016, and I looked at the slide decks uh, from, that, from then, 2016, and we were talking about a world that seemed very scary. Um, and I remember starting that presentation, one of those days of lectures talking about the threats that were coming. It was in 2016. Uh, and we had slides of things like, you know, the world is changing very quickly, and we know that, that we're sort of changing at an exponential rate in terms of all of the bad stuff that's coming. And I had a slide about, um, drought and climate change, and that seemed sort of far away. And we had a slide about uh, pandemics. And at that point, I think we were dealing with Zika. We remember Zika? That seems far away. That's not like the pandemic that we're talking about now. Um, but we were, we were talking a little bit about what, these, what humanity has done to itself and how this world that's so packed together and is changing so quickly is also ripping itself apart. So it was a very depressing lecture. If anybody was at that first lecture, it was like, I think I named the second day of it, like this is happy stuff and jokes. Um, and then the third, one of the third slides was about war and people on the move. Um, so I think we're in a, a very def difficult moment right now in human history where we see uh, changes in the world that are affecting humans, individual humans, in very difficult ways. Um, I'm going to talk about connectivity, but I think that's underneath some of the changes that are happening on a geopolitical level, on a global level. It's why we're able to see uh, what's happening, the horrible stuff that's happening in Ukraine in real time. Uh, and I just got off a, a call with our office. We have uh, obviously teams in UNICEF who are uh, both in Ukraine and Belarus. Um, and I know that many of you have friends and family as well who are suffering through this moment in human history. Um, and somebody said once that it's like, it's always a bad time to live when a lot of history is being made all at once. And so we're in that moment right now. Um, that was the really depressing first day. Like this was six years ago, five years ago, that we were looking at what could come, and then obviously that that knocks onto like people on the move, people traveling across borders, a, a world that's shifted and changed, in a world where sovereignty means something different. Uh, and six years ago, I was at I was at UNICEF. I was um, running a thing called UNICEF Ventures. You can look it up if you take a take a Google. Um, UNICEF Ventures was a small team, is a small team, that set up the first venture fund in the United Nations. And I came to it in this weird way, right? I, I, didn't, I was not a UN person. The UN is like, we have a, it's a very small bar on this, but it's usually a very big blue thing. Um, UNICEF itself is an organization that's the world's children's organization. It deals specifically with kids who have nobody else to fight for them. Um, it's an organization of about 15,000 people in 190 countries around the world. And so I kind of knew it like a little bit, because before that I was doing tech startups in East Africa and the Middle East. And I knew UNICEF had these big cars, of very flashy cars that would drive around compared to the guy had a really bad car. Uh, so compared to my bad car, the UNICEF cars looked really nice. Um, and they were always sort of everywhere. And you saw them and they're on the back of the Barcelona jersey. So you've seen UNICEF there. Um, but it's an organization that works for populations, usually that are left out of every government's plan. Like there is, if a government makes a strategic plan for the country, there's you know, four or five parts of it. Part one, two, three sometimes get done. Part five never gets done. It's the bottom quintile of people economically. It's the people who are sort of always at the edges. And this organization, that one, was set up in the 1940s after World War II um, to make sure that children have an equal right, regardless of which quintile of income they're in. Um, and it looks at like five major things for kids, health. So you've probably seen you know, vaccinations and health kits. And UNICEF also works in education. We'll talk a teeny bit about that. Making sure that kids have access to school, to be able to be in a place like this is a dream. Um, that they have access to protection and identity. Sorry, I'm not usually like, this is a, this is a weird week. 
that they have access to identity uh, and protection. And so something like a third of people in the world don't have a birth registration or birth certificate, a birth identity, which means that you can't travel. So if you don't have a birth identity, you don't have a passport, you don't exist in formal systems. Uh, one of the things that UNICEF has, has done is help to register kids. And this is always, it's not the wealthy kids and it's not the kids who are like kind of okay, it's really the ones who are left behind. Um, and UNICEF also works in emergencies. So we worked last year in about 300 emergencies around the world. These are everything from um, big environmental disasters to acts of war. And so it was, last time I was here, I was running this venture fund. It was exciting. We were sort of investing in open source tech startups. Um, it was the first time that anybody had ever, we'd, we kind of brought this VC thinking into the UN. It's a big bureaucracy. So this thing like, I mean, if you try to get, it's very, very Baroque is a nice way of talking about it. You try to get something done in a big bureaucracy, it takes like 15 years when it could take five minutes. Um, but it has offices in 190 countries around the world. So when you do get something moving, it changes. It changes a lot. It just is frustratingly, like horrifyingly slow. And so we set up this little venture fund. We started taking money from a few investors, uh, our LPs, and we started investing it in open source tech startups around the world. So only in emerging markets, very, very early stage, $100,000 tickets and below, uh, usually right around $100,000. Uh, and in tech startups in super low liquidity markets and places where you couldn't raise startup capital in 2015, 2016, even hard to do now. Um, we funded the first drone and UAV corridors in the world for testing drones and we set them up in Malawi, in Kazakhstan, in Vanuatu, and in Sierra Leone. And like, that's cool. So suddenly you have this ability to bring local entrepreneurs from countries that don't have access to the, you know, huge drone testing corridors that you have in France or in Ireland. Um, Kazakhstan was a little bit of, a, of an odd one out there that was fun because we set up the tallest. So has it, who's spent time in Kazakhstan? Anybody? Right. So as you'll know, Lana, like everything has to be the biggest, like they have the, the biggest bush sculpture in the world, the third, fourth largest flagpole. Uh, in the world. They also have the, the tallest drone corridor because of what we did, so it's a 10 kilometer drone corridor, uh, just because it has to kind of be big uh, for it's a big country. But so we set up these drone corridors to test things like delivering vaccines. We did the first drone vaccine delivery in the Pacific Islands about four or five years ago uh, through the startup companies we invested in, and that allowed for vaccines to be delivered in these islands in the Pacific in hours, like two, three hours, rather than in four days. Because rather than going by canoe with these vaccines that have to be stored between two and four degrees, or two and eight degrees, depending on the vaccine. Now everybody, everybody knows so much about vaccines now that like, we don't need to tell the whole story, but it's really hard to move vaccines around the world. Uh, we could deliver them by drones. And in the Pacific Islands, you have these really rocky mountains, so you have to climb up 300 meters and over, and it's all hot and everything, and suddenly you could do it by drone delivery. Um, we set up some of the first data science, really applied AI, applied ML in the UN, in UNICEF, and last time I was here, we were talking a lot about the work happening during Zika, where you had people moving, and you were trying to predict how a disease would move. And it was funny, funny, haha. -ha. It was funny then because we were like, oh, let's talk about what, how epidemics move, and nobody really knew about that now, so now we all know, right? And we know that we, they move through airports. So everybody, we, we watched that. But we had to explain back then, to, in the innocent days, six years ago, how a disease like Zika would move, it would move because people would go to airports, they'd get bitten by a mosquito, go somewhere else, mosquito would bite them. Now we've seen over the last two years how clearly human population movements and this new world that we've created where people move everywhere affect something like disease spreads. But we built the first ability to model that type of stuff. And in fact, wow, what's it, COVID time now, two years ago when uh, everything started, our team was the first uh, of the teams to move out to totally virtualize it somewhat in January, late January of that first year. Um, because you could already see in the data, you could see what was happening, and it looked exactly like what happened with Zika. Anyway, that's all to say. There was this history behind, uh, behind our work. Our team is about 30 people. It was about 30 people in UNICEF. Um, and these are all people who came from outside, who came from environments like this, who were startup. Uh, mostly, most of us have failed at more startups than we've succeeded at. That's like, I think, or some of us at all of them. Uh, you know, who've done a lot of engineering in our background, who've done uh, design, who've done product and who find this world of international development like, very confusing, but also very big. And a lot of us are, are working there because you have access to kind of decision makers at the, at the highest level. So if you're trying to move something like uh, a, a disease tracking protocol using data from health centers, ingesting it into a machine learning platform that you've built, and then spitting out some ideas about where you should have population control and stop people to you know, do checkpoints for testing, that's hard to get done if you don't have the Minister of Health saying it's okay. If you're trying to register births 
and make it a change from 30% of the world who don't have births you know, registered to 20% or 10%, if you don't have the, again, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Statistics on board, nobody's going to change that. Uh, just to close that story, in Uganda, one of the things that we're very proud of is that there the birth registration rates, rates were flipped. It was like 70% of kids didn't have a, a birth identity. 70% of the population, so that's like, like this whole part of the room, right? Um, was not registered at birth and so couldn't get into secondary education, certainly tertiary, you, you know, university, wouldn't be able to apply for a, a passport, wouldn't have access to all sorts of banking services. So in 2013, 2014, it was about 69, 60, 70%. Um, by using basic mobile phones through, again, some technology we invested in, some open source tech, we were able to let birth registration happen very close to the point of, of birth. The reason that many kids weren't registered, this, this comes back to this project in a second, I promise, but I'll tell you. The reason that people weren't registered was because if you're a mother and you've just had a kid and you're four days away from a birth registration center, a health center, not even any health center, but the one where you can actually register the kid, that's, like, that's a long journey to go through and you have to go with the kid. And you, maybe if you're, you have a you have bus and there's a bike and a walking and a kid and you get there and then there's some guy there, it's always a guy, leather jacket, they're usually wearing a leather jacket and sunglasses. You get the idea of the kind of guy, and he's like, great, so for an extra 30 euro, you know, you, on top of the free fee that you shouldn't be paying, you can register the kids, so you've got to walk somewhere, you maybe have to pay something, you have to interact with people, and you've just had a baby and you're taking time off of work. It's a lot of disincentive to be part of the formal system. And what we did was made a, a mobile app that allowed you to register kids, like right at the point of birth, by the health attendant, by the doctor. Let me go to this other part of the screen. It's divided into three areas, in case you're interested in how a project like this works. I'll show you, uh, just quickly, the setup of it. This is, so this is a presentation we showed to one of our, we've got a few investors in Giga. That was my, like, that was, I don't know, that was my schedule in the back. We have a few investors. This is one we, we just gave, um, I made fun of Elon at the beginning. Elon Musk has given us a bunch of money to work on this, particularly for that real-time monitoring system. Um, he and a few others believe that this real-time stuff is important, obviously, for their business, but also for humanity. Um, and so this is an update we just did for, for his team. Um, uh, a few months ago, but one part of Giga works very, very hard at building the tech behind this, and we're super, super proud of this open source tech stack, and if anybody's like interested and wants to get involved, we have a ton of ways to do that. Um, this map does a lot of things. I think you, you get a sense of it from, from this discussion. The other two parts of Giga, so there are about 15 people working on that, 15, 20. Um, the other two parts of Giga are one working on the financing, so this costs a ton of money. Uh, not this mapping, but connecting every school in the world costs something like 400 billion euro, plus or minus. But it's like, that's quite a bit of money. Um, that's, that's not charity money or f aid philanthropy money, that's real investment money because this is infrastructure. Um, so it's not money that people lose, it's money that they get back. But it's still, that's a significant quantum of, of euro or dollar uh, to talk about. So there's a part of the team that works on the structured finance and how we build the instruments for getting money into the country so that we can bring investors in to do this kind of great work. And we've mobilized about 200 million, 300 million euro in the last year. So that's kind of big money for us. We're all startup side of things. That's like more later stage. That's kind of scary for us. And then the third part of the team works with contracting with government. So it's sort of map, finance, contract. Um, we've done it. We, we also, because we build tech, we build in this kind of prototype -y fast way. Um, so we, we are building prototypes of this work. Um, this is a prototype system that we've set up in Kenya. Um, where we've connected about thousands, uh, 120 schools in Kenya so far, so that's about 40,000 students uh, in Kenya. This, oh, this last year, this is cool, so we connected 3,000 schools this year. I should have started with this. We connected 3,000 schools, that's a million point one students in the last year. That's kind of neat. Um, that's very neat. In Kenya, the prototype model is Connect. We have partners who work on the ed tech, that's not us. So nothing we do, when I said finance and map and connect, there's no software, we don't do any ed tech stuff, but we have partners who do. So we're like, well, those will bring the connectivity, those folks will do it, and then somebody has to train the teachers, so that's another group. So somebody has to make sure it's safe, because the internet is a terrible place, essentially. Like, pretty much all of the internet is bad. Uh, and, like, if it was a physical building, I would never let my kid in it. It's, like, disgusting. The internet's just awful. It's full of awful people, like all of humanity. Anyway. Um, you have to make sure that when you're bringing people online for the first time, you don't expose them to all of this horror without people having the skills to kind of deal with it. And so 
this is kind of an example of how this, how this all works. Those are the three areas I talked about, so map, finance, and connect. These are the, the countries that we're in. So the blue countries are the most advanced, the gray countries. It's a weird design choice for that color. Anyway, the gray countries are the second most advanced, and the orange countries are the least advanced. But it gives you a sense of the three regions we've started in. And because we're building prototypes, we're building in Eastern Caribbean, which somehow started to include Brazil, but OK, Eastern Caribbean, this sort of east to west Africa, and then Central Asia. Those are, those are the three areas that we started in, because each one of them proves out a different set of questions for us. And we start with like every startup, we start with a bunch of ideas and thoughts that you can, you know, what happens in a place where it gets from minus 40 up to plus 40? What happens in a place where there's 15 different mobile network operators and you're not quite sure how to sort them out? What happens in a place where there are islands and there's only one provider? So all of these different dynamics come into the, you know, kind of variable mix as you're building prototypes and you get to learn a lot as opposed to many public sector or UN projects which just try to do everything from the beginning. So we build a set of product first. What else did we show Elon's team? Okay, Kenya, that was, I said that. Um, yeah, always good to like put your investors' names on there, so that was that. Um, but we are doing actual school connectivity in, in a few of the countries immediately. Um, and that's gotten us to that 1.1 million kids number. And I guess I just wanna end this because I've talked for a long time and I wanted to have a chance to have some conversation. Sorry, this is a horrible slide too, but just look at the top part. Um, ew, I'm sorry for that. You look at the top line of that slide, that's the important bit. Um, we did a study recently with The Economist that looked at what happens when you connect schools. And a school is a center point for a community. Whether or not you like how schools work today, which like I don't, I don't really like a lot of what gets taught. I don't think it's super useful for the future. But the school is there, it's there in almost every community in the world. It's a place where kids go to learn and the community knows about it. As a hub, it is also a node. It's a node for the community. If, they, if you want to pay somebody, you can pay them from a school in the future. If you want to check crop data, soil pH, somebody can come to a school once it's connected and connect to that Wi-Fi hotspot and sell their data to the internet. If you want to be an artist, if you are an artist and don't want to be an artist, whatever, you're an artist, you want to make money, <laughs> maybe you don't if you're a really good artist, I don't know, but you want to make your NFT. You can't do it if you're not connected. Kind of, we all hate NFTs, okay, fine. Suddenly you're part of a global network. Suddenly the economy extends out to places, capital extends outside of capital cities, and you're part of that green world, not the red world. And so the study we did at The Economist shows that if you connected every school in Sierra Leone, which we saw, to the level of school connectivity in Finland, which is like 103% connectivity, whatever, if you connected Sierra Leone at that level, you'd raise GDP, well, it says, this is actually wrong, by 18% in Sierra Leone. Um, if you connected one of the most difficult to connect places in the world to the level of Finland, you'd raise the GDP by almost 20%. Uh, that's incredible, and that's because that connectivity provides so much opportunity and choice to everybody around the school that you just don't have if you're part of the disconnected world. Um, you're always supposed to start with the problem in these kind of discussions. I'm gonna end with it. The problem is that like half of the world is not connected to the internet right now. Um, it's not connected to the good internet. That's something like 1.2 1, 1 billion young people. There's just a huge number of people who aren't going to access all of the stuff that you take for granted and I take for granted every day. That's the digital future, that's the digital surface. We already saw with COVID that people have been set back by years in terms of learning. It's not that one year is one year, one year is five years or seven years of learning. All of these other traumas happen. If you're a kid who's displaced by war, you're set back by years. If you're not able to connect to things, to other people, to learning resources, you're not able to be part of the future. And that's really scary because that makes a world that's even more divided than it is today. Hard to imagine, but possible, very likely. And so this connectivity mission for us is not about just getting connectivity out to schools. It's about trying to figure out how to solve what I think is one of the biggest divides that's coming, that's there in the world, which is this divide between people who have that access to opportunity and people who don't. Um, and it's just a pleasure to be able to be part of a team that's doing this stuff. There's my schedule again. And there's a roadmap document. Let's get back to the screen. Um, why aren't you there? Uh, that's building all of this stuff. And there we are. Where do you live? There you live. Um, and, and also working with governments like at Mobile World Congress, the, the best meeting that I had yesterday was with the Minister of IT from Rwanda and her team. 
who are really, really trying to solve this. And the thing that they're doing in Rwanda, which is so cool with this connectivity contracting, is that as they make people, they put this tender out for companies to bid on, you're not just bidding on connecting the school, you're bidding on setting up a small business center. And so the bids that we got back from mobile tech, mobile network operators in Rwanda are all about how you can connect the school and make money from the community around it, reducing the price of that school to almost zero. And so being able to be inspired by teams like that in all the countries we're working in is, is also really cool. Anyway, sorry for talking so long. I thought I was going to talk less, but I like talking about this stuff um, and would love to chat more with you. Thanks. Throw this at somebody? Okay. Actually, take the second one. Who wants to start with questions? Hello. Wait. Try again. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So this is Sergio from Barcelona. And uh, my question is, like, uh, there's a this difficulty to, uh, to get connectivity to, to the spaces, but this, this difficulty comes out because uh, because because uh, installation is expensive. The, 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 to have a five G in every in, in every place, it's expensive. Which are the real costs that make this difficult, or it's more uh, a government thing, or both? <laughs> that is what I suppose. Uh, if you break the cost up into four areas, the biggest cost is capex, <clears throat> the cost of the capital expenditures of of initial projects. So. It's digging fiber, or it's putting the cement down to put the satellite dishes. It's the physical stuff. That's like 80, 85% of the cost, something like that. Um, OPEX is tiny. The operating expenses every year are like a fraction of that. And so if you think about it for just, I'll give you average school. Don't, this is not, I'm not giving any country, but like average school is like 3,000 euro CapEx to get it connected, 3,000, 4,000 euro. That's to get the fiber out and the power and all of that about 300 euro a year OPEX. So that's the order of magnitude. So those are two of the big costs, but then you plan out for three years, so that's you know, maybe 3,000 and 1,000, something like that. Um, uh, one of the other layers is the training and making sure people are able to actually maintain the, the wireless service or the, you know, the kind of end piece. And then the fourth cost center is government regulation. Um, because in order to get this stuff to happen, you need to lobby with government for a bunch of things. So like in Brazil, for example, uh, every country, most countries have something called a universal service fund, which is a tax fund for all the network operators. They all pay into it every year, like some part of you, all the money you pay for your mobile phone. And those things are always used for something else. They're supposed to be used to connect people, but they're always used for something else. There, anyway, there are public buckets of money that are supposed to be used for this that aren't. And we advocate, one of, one of the things that Giga does is we advocate to open those buckets up. In Brazil, we opened up $60 million a year of funding in the government that just wasn't being accessed before. And we had to pay money to do that. We had to, you know, advocates and lawyers and stuff. To, and the thing that we had to lawyer, the reason it wasn't open, was that it was set up 20 years ago or something, 15 years ago. And it said, this is used for extending the reach of landlines. This fund can be used to extend landlines in Brazil. And literally that word landline was not letting it be used for any of this. So we paid like a whole bunch of expensive lawyers to bang away on that word for 11 months, and they did, and the Senate and the President both signed the bill, and now we can use that money for schools. So that's the, the fourth cost is government. You know, those are the, the four costs. I can go a, a lot more into it, but that's the basics. Hey, my name is George, I'm from Germany. Thanks for coming here and talking to us. My question was actually regarding uh, specifically the satellites and whether you have thought of some are working together with Starlink, because I know Starlink is trying to gain or provide access to 4G or 5G, whatever it is, in a much, much cheaper way than what you just described to us. Yeah. Um, I'll speak very broadly and generally, but since Elon is an investor in our project, you could imagine that there's some interest in his companies in engaging with this. Um, one of the things that we do, all of this data is open source. So the answer is yes, we are thinking about working with satellite providers. The way that we do it, because we work with public procurement, we as Giga don't choose a single provider. So we don't say we go with Telefonica or Vodafone or Starlink. What we say is that government puts out a, a tender and the people come to meet it. The company, so this, 
in Rwanda, this is a lake, this is a forest, and this is like an area with just with farm, farmland, tea, tea plantations. This area is hard to make money off of as a mobile provider. That's why it's not connected. The group that's going to come and bid on that is going to be a combination of satellite and mobile and some others. This map is all open, and satellite providers that may sound like Schmarschmlink are already using this data to plan their distribution. Questions? Behind you, two people. Hello, uh, my name is Robert. Uh, I was going to ask about so you said that your biggest expense is CapEx and the physical building, which I imagine is quite. Uh, resource consumption, uh, access to internet. How, what do you think is going to be the progress rate on this in like 10 years? Do you think it can cover like what, 5% or, I was, my original question was going to be like when can we see 100% but I mean, I imagine that's pretty unrealistic. So what is going to be the progress rate for this project? Uh, I hope it's more than 5%. I'd feel really like I was wasting my time if we're not doing something. Um, I want to map, we'll map every school in the world in the next three years. So right now we've mapped a million schools. Nobody knows how many there are. There's no person who can tell you how many schools there are in the world. It's just a question mark. I believe they're between six and seven million, we, we think. We will have mapped all of those in three years. Everybody said that was impossible before. At least we'll know the answer, the actual answer to the question of how connected they are. That's already huge. Um, I believe that we can at least do 20% more schools connected in the next two years, three years, than now. It doesn't mean that they'll all be done by the end of those two years, but they'll be started. And then these projects, as you said, CapEx can do another year, year and a half after. Infrastructure projects are usually five to eight years minimum, eight years. But I think that in the next two to three years, we'll have eyes on another 20% in progress. And I'm saying that based on the finances that we've already gathered this year. Um, it's always the last 10% that's hardest to do, but like, this is not supposed to be a decade-long project. I don't think we want to spend, I think that's not our goal. It's supposed to be something that we can make significant enough progress on in the next two or three years that it inspires people to do the rest. So I think we'll be very, very happy if we can uh, get the number up to 70, 80 percent, um, but also have that path to financing for the rest of it. And then I'd like to go work on the last 10 percent. So like, to me, that's the, so, because I, I hate being part of the middle of things. I'm just not good at that. That's like not where my, so I like to, so I only kind of get this rolling and then figure out these, like, how do you make sure that refugee kids have access to internet? How do you make sure that people in mountains, that, like that kind of stuff, come at it from that side? But yeah, for sure, not, not a 10 year. Uh, internet connectivity, because I know like the CapEx is about infrastructure and stuff like that. So are you thinking um, while building this infrastructure, also like making more connectivity through roads? Like you are already like, digging into the earth and stuff like that. Are you also thinking about doing roads while making the, like, the infrastructure for, for the connectivity? It's a really, really good question. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, the answer is actually we follow, we usually follow the other ones, not the other way around. Um, so, let's see. Um, in. So we've started working in a few um, countries in Central America where, that's not a great example either. Um, anyway, we've started working in a few countries where we, we actually usually come after the roads um, in, in an interesting way where, like, you can see the roads on here already. The schools that are near the roads are already connected. Where we, where we find our sweet spot is the schools that are like five to, Two to, two to five kilometers away from the road. So actually the connectivity and the, and the electricity and the water is already built to that road part. It's that next, it's like the main blood vessels there, it's the little capillaries that aren't there. And the, so it's a, but it's a great question. We often follow the road people and the railroad people. So railroad is great for fiber because it's already pre-dug and you can kind of dig along it. Um, so we have ITU, this telecommunications union, has all the maps for that thick, the thick piece. But honestly, most of that is already done. Like, that's pretty much been solved. It's the, it's the little places, like here or here, that, is, that are much harder to get to. And so the flip side of the question, which is a very good question, is how do we make sure that there are now digital roads that get to places before they get to other places? And what I mean by that is digital finance, specifically. So like, 
when I think about what the other roads are that we need to build, is to make sure that people in newly connected areas have access to all of the, the finance stack, payments, loans, all of that kind of stuff that we have access to in a connected area quickly. Because if they don't have access to that stuff, there, there's no road to the digital world. And so one of the coolest things we're doing is now in West Africa, there's a company that's called Jumia, which is like the, it's like the Amazon of delivery services for a lot of 12, 15 countries in Africa. And with Jumia, we're actually making each of the schools be kind of little finance centers so that you can order stuff to the school. It can become a delivery place. You can pay the school for it and stuff like that. And that's pushing digital finance out further. And so, but, so I think it's like, what other things can we pack on to connectivity is absolutely the right question. And I think it's about finance. Like that finance layer is, is key. Yeah. Okay, we are also following online. If there's anyone that has a question, please chat or comment. Um, anyone here? Hi, um, I'm very interested in using social entrepreneurship to tackle international development issues. Uh, and kind of similar to what you were saying earlier, I was at MWC before this, so that's why I have this jacket on. Uh, and I we'll was, forgive you, it's fine. <laughs> but I was very disappointed, even with the four years from now, that's the, the best part of it. There was surprisingly... Et cetera, all the disclaimers. Sorry, lawyers, but Lana made me say it. Uh, but I did go and visit a site yesterday, right around here, um, that is very connected to the municipal innovation team and all of that. And the idea is that we would have a, a small team of, of technologists, our tech team, the people building this, uh, located here. And that that team would work with the Barcelona infrastructure, the, the big four network operators here, the people who do the cables, landing, um, and the kind of greater Barcelona Tech you know, University infrastructure to build this stuff faster and better. We're super, super excited about it. We're looking to have another, so we'll be out here again in April to kind of bring things a little closer and hopefully finalize stuff by summer, early summer. Um, then we'll be able to talk about it legally because none of that's actually happened yet, I promise. Um, but one of, the, one of the pieces that we'd like to do is to figure out how to work with local universities. And so for sure, Harbor Space is top of our list and in fact is in the proposal that both we presented and the city presented back. And this is from national, uh, regional, and city governments. So it's, we've gotten all three uh, levels engaged, which is, <laughs> if you think this is hard, that's, <laughs> I promise it's really easy. Uh, but, but also UNICEF and, and ITU together. So I think it's going to be a really great collaboration. And we, so right now our team is sort of global because of COVID. We've been everywhere. We haven't had a home. Um, and so this is going to be very exciting for us to have two homes. The other one is close to here, but it's not Barcelona. Uh, and we'll be announcing that soon too. Um, and so I think there's a lot we can, I mean, I, I can imagine there's a ton we do together from directed research, collaborations. It's all open source, so people also can take it and, and run with the things they're interested in. Um, to bringing you know people to come and work in the offices and it's very it's a cool space it's a very startupy space so we like it and that's I think so we'll definitely be back here end of April and then uh, officially kind of I think June June July. So with that final question, with a nice local touch that might actually really be touching our lives in the future. Let's see about that. Um, we are going to end this event. It's a little bit past five right now. Christopher did agree um, to reschedule some of his things. So there is some more time left that we go downstairs now, guys. Okay. If you're interested for some drinks and some informal chat. All right. Thank you for joining us. Thank you also to our online crowd and especially thank you to Chris.